music. It's the love of music that brings us together. The love of music that forms the bond between us. For the next hour, join us for the love of music, presenting those aspects of music which excite, provoke, and inspire. Our host today is David Dubow, WNCN music director, pianist, educator, and writer on music. Here is David Dubow for the love of music. Today is the second program with Bruce Posner and Joe Patridge, who host Concert Grand, which is on every Monday at 6 o'clock on Fordham's station, WFUV. Last time we had wonderful performances, and this time we have Horowitz, Eileen Joyce, Sofronitsky, and many others. I didn't ask you last time, how did you two meet to eventually do 5,174 straight programs or whatever on the piano? Well... We first uh, actually met because I was taking lessons from Bruce because uh, when uh, I wasn't much of a pianist when we first met and Bruce was, so I studied with him and he was working as the classical program director at WFUV and needed an assistant programmer, so I went in and we started working on that and the slot opened up and uh, we began doing the show and that was it. I would say the one amusing thing is that all the while I was a student at Fordham, I was too shy to go on the air. Um, and it was only until after I graduated and did Joe actually convince me to, uh, to speak on the air. Uh, our first few shows were entirely me engineering and Joe uh, behind the microphone. Uh, but as you can tell, that's changed. You're certainly comfortable now and, to say the least, articulate. You love, both of you, the piano, and you can certainly be seen at many concerts. Um, but n you're no longer the protege of Bruce. Now you are... Uh, his his anchor man or or what is it called? Both of you are equals. Co hosts. Co hosts yes, on this. Whatever. What do you do? Do you have people come to the studios there? Or Rarely. How do you... No, we we usually, we usually go and uh, and we'll tape an interview with any particular pianist at their convenience. I'll we bet you have some way. fabulous stories then. Yes, we do. <laughs> As usual, the, the most fabulous ones never get on the air. Uh -huh. That's right. And that's because they're just too fabulous. They're too fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> You've brought Horowitz. And who is Eileen Joyce? We'll get to that. Mm. We'll get to that. Vladimir Sofronitsky, that was this, uh, the, uh, the son-in-law of, of Scriabin and, and Nats Friedman. And Pachman was called the Chopin Z of the piano. And Moritz Rosenthal was, was one of the gods of the day. And Paderewski, we're going to hear. Oh, it's fabulous. I can't wait. What shall we start with? We're going to start with Horowitz. And uh, clearly, when you're dealing with someone like Horowitz, you have a tremendous amount of material in print. Mm -hmm. I wanted to find a favorite recording that was short and not so well known. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that I've succeeded in picking one, certainly, that's not so well known and is short, and certainly is one of my favorites. This is his recording of the Stravinsky Danse Russe. Um, from not Petrushka, only, right? From Petrushka. And not only is it remarkable for the speed, mm -hmm. which is fully 20 seconds faster than any other performance, even today, um, but also the color and the transitions between the sections. Um, when, it, when the key changes in, in the place where there are left, there's a very rapid left-hand figuration that caused Stravinsky to say he couldn't play the piece. Horowitz shines. <laughs> um, this is, by the way, from a, uh, an LP transfer of some 78s he did from 1933 to 35, and this is from a French EMI disc. Um, and I think it's a great recording. Incidentally, uh, this record was released uh, in the United States uh, on the Angel Great Recordings of the uh, Century series, but the uh, Don Truth wasn't on the record. Mm -hmm. So it is not actually that, that available in the United States. Well, this was, if made in 1921, shortly after the actual um, composition that, that yeah. uh, Stravinsky made for Arthur Rubinstein. Yeah. So this, is, uh, this piece has now become one of the, the badges of contemporary virtuosity for young pianists. Here, then, is Horowitz, in Danse Russe from Petrushka by Stravinsky in a 1921 recording. <laughs> Thank you. 
Danz Rus by Stravinsky, and those were the Hands of Horowitz playing in 1921. Think of it, 60 years later. I think it also shows that he is an exemplary performer of what was then contemporary music. That's right. Uh, And even his performances of the Barber Sonata uh, from 1950 absolutely stand uh, as definitive performances of these pieces. We have a program with nine pianists, and Horowitz is the only one that we'll be hearing that is actually active, who is playing. He was born 1904. Now, the Australian-born virtuoso, who, who was a wonderful career for a while, Eileen Joyce. What do you know of her, Joe? Not, not very much. It's, it's hard to find information of her. I know that she was born in Tasmania, Australia, in 1912. She's not currently, as far as I know, very active, but had a big career in the 40s and 50s and uh, was considered a virtuoso mm-hmm. and certainly proves it in this um, Recording, which is by a pianist uh, and composer named Paul de Schleitzer. Mm-hmm. And he lived from 1884 until 1969, only died 12 years ago. And this piece was written in 1910. It's an etude in A flat, opus one, number two. Sort of sounds a little bit like Moskowski. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sounds to me like a, a cross between a Moskowski etude and a Liszt etude, really, because it's a little bigger than your average Moskowski right. etude, mm-hmm. um, but in the same sort of style, finger twister type uh, etude. Beautiful piece with a, a three-hand effect at the end. Um, Paul Schlerzer, by the way, was also senior professor at the uh, Moscow Conservatory in the time of Scriabin, um, and was also Scriabin's brother-in-law when Scriabin married uh, his second wife. Mm-hmm. This performance is uh, one of the greatest performances ever recorded, uh, not only of this piece, but uh, of any piece. It's just astonishing piano playing. And um, this, by the way, was how Eileen Joyce uh, got her first record, was an entrepreneur had supposedly heard her practicing this and came in. And this was in London during World War II, I believe, and said... Uh, you, you know, you must record this because it'll sell like hotcakes or something uh, to that effect. And um, I don't know if it did or not, but it certainly should have. Well, World War II uh, recording, 78 originally. Then let's hear this work, the etude in, in A-flat. And who's the composer? Paul de Schleitzer. Yes, you pronounce it well, that's why I ask you. <laughs> I just say de Schleitzer. Okay, let's hear Eileen Joyce in this Opus 1, number 2. There's another one that Joseph Levine used to play right. in double notes, which is just excruciatingly I know. difficult. That's Opus 1, number 1. <laughs> yes. Here is... I don't think he went past Opus 1, There's frankly. nothing else in the catalog. Yeah. Well, we've come up then with a lot more than we thought we would on not only Eileen Joyce, but the composer, De Schletzer. Let's hear Eileen Joyce. <laughs> Thank you. 
What smiles on your face? I'll let you outro that, as they say in radio. Joe. Okay, that was the Etude by Paul de Schleitzer in A flat, Opus One, Number Two, played by Eileen Joyce from a uh, World War II uh, in London recording, seventy-eight. We're going to take a minute or two for some messages, and if you would like to stay on, we'll continue our program. <laughs> you got it. Okay. Bruce Posner and Joe Patrich, two men who love piano playing and the art of the pianist, are here as my guest. We have heard Eileen Joyce, not so well known, born in 1912, and Vladimir Horowitz, a legend indeed. The third artist on this show, Sofronitsky. Tell me of him. Well, he was uh, a Russian pianist, as far as I know, never came to the United States, born in 1902 and died in 1963. Uh, perhaps the greatest Russian pianist that I've ever heard. Uh, everything he recorded was was just marvelous, uh, a seriousness, a, a powerful technique. His uh, specialty was Scriabin, which he probably played better than anybody else. It certainly, uh, it really lends truth to the statement that Russia keeps the best pianists at home because uh, I really don't think, I think I would put him on a level with Richter at his best, certainly. Um, this performance that we have is of the Rachmaninoff A2 Tableau in A minor, a very famous one, uh, Opus 39, number 6. And this is a particular one that Rachmaninoff recorded as well as made a piano roll of. Um, and it's played a lot, but this performance um, has that quality which I mentioned last week in connection uh, with the Moisevich. Uh, which sounds to me like the pianist is possessed when he plays mm -hmm. this. Um, not only is it completely different than Rachmaninoff's performance, not only it's, it's completely different than the score itself. He does things that are specifically not marked, mm -hmm. and nevertheless it works, and you feel that there's something demonic pushing him on to play mm -hmm. the piece this way. Um, and I think this is one of the greatest recordings ever made. Is this one of his live recordings? You know, it's hard to say. Uh, these Melodia discs are not... Um, they're not too specific. Um, I know, I can tell you for a fact that there are live performances on this side that this comes from, and it may yes. very well be live. Well, he had, as you say, this, this possessed quality because he did like to, to do live performances, and he, um, he, had, he had this improvisational power. If he was on, he could just be an inspired artist. Sometimes when he wasn't on, he could be a little eccentric and a little perfunctory, and sometimes he didn't practice. But, wow, those Scriabin recordings of the fifth sonata, the fourth. Mm -hmm. I'm not so fond of the Schubert B-flat and things like that. But when, he, when his imagination is flowing, it's flowing. Horowitz heard him do Scriabin in Paris, he was, but he was not known outside of the Soviet Union, and he didn't come here. But... What an artist. And he was idolized, though, in Moscow. And he would, all the time his concerts were filled, as you probably know. And he played on the Scriabin piano at the museum, and th these were big events. What else do you offhand know of Sofronitsky, who was one of my favorite pianists also? Well, he made uh, many recordings, actually. They've sort of managed to filter into the United States. They sure have. Intervals. Virtually all of Scriabin's piano music at least he touched upon it, mm -hmm. uh, also recorded a lot of major works of brilliant and beautiful Liszt Sonata and perhaps the finest recording of the Schumann Symphonic Etudes yes. that I know of. Where can we get his recordings? Well, They're not easy to get anymore. Mm -hmm. Most of them are out of print and can only be had as imports or... The Four Continental, Continental Corporation, though, has some. Four also Zneni. doesn't have many. There's mm -hmm. a, Zne a, sh a store called Zneni out on the West Coast. He is so worth attempting to get, though. He's, he's an inspired man. Yes, he was. Um, let's hear then this Opus 39, number 60, A minor, A2 tableau by Rachmaninoff. <laughs> Thank you. 
great Vladimir Sofronitsky, 1963, he lived till 1963 in a performance of the Rachmaninoff Etude Tableau in A minor. Ignaz Friedman is one of the legendary pianists. Uh, Gunnar Johansson was saying to me recently, he's never gotten over that effect. The originality is just fabulous and really not eccentric as some people have also said. I just think brilliant and poetic and a technique that very few have ever had. Do you agree? Absolutely. Yes. This performance we have um, is of the Chopin Nocturne, Opus 55, number 2, and it's certainly one of Friedman's legendary recordings. This is the one that Harold Schoenberg said is the finest, possibly the finest of all recordings of a Chopin Nocturne, mm -hmm. am I correct? That's, yes, that's and it possibly true. is. Mm -hmm. um, it was made in 1936, um, not uh, pretty much towards the close of his career, his active career. Uh, he stopped playing only about five years later. But uh, you'd never know it from listening to this. Um, there are three voices, basically, in this piece. There's a beautiful left-hand part, and then there's a duet in the right hand, and uh, you hear everything. Um, and each part seems to have its own line, and he ha he's able to have a rubato for one part, not the other, and he they interplay beautifully, even though it's one hand playing two and the third hand playing the third. The balance is extraordinary, and the poetry is extraordinary. It's a pity that we have so few recordings of these giants. What does Friedman mean to you? Is he one of your all-time favorites, Joe? I would say uh, he did not make many recordings, but of the recordings he made, uh, my favorites are mostly a Chopin, Third Ballade, the, uh, the etudes that he recorded mm -hmm. are just marvelous, especially the um, Opus 10, number 7, C major, the double note oh, etude, yeah. which cannot be matched for its lightness, its precision. It's and what an about, amazing pianist. What about the mazurkas, which, I mean, some think that that is the absolute end-all in mazurka playing. Well, you see, the mazurkas are interesting because uh, I tend, me personally, of course, to like the sort of approach that somebody like Rosenthal gave to the mazurkas, and Friedman's are very strong and they move, but it's not the type of mazurka playing I like, and yet they're great recordings yes. of simply a different style of they're playing. They're earthy, is basically. I mean, I think the word that could be used to describe them, they're very uh, close to the, to the folk origins of the yes. pieces. As a matter of fact, the Mendelssohn Songs Without Words that were on that same record, when that record originally came out, are probably among Friedman's greatest recordings, mm -hmm. especially the hunting song comes to mind immediately. He had something, and he played constantly, everywhere, I mean, almost daily in a way. They estimated 3,000 3, concerts, concerts between 1904 and 1943. And he composed about 100 piano pieces, yeah. and he was an expert poker player. He took the money of absolutely everyone on every steamship the world has ever known. So and he was a fascinating man, and he was an editor of piano music. So this man had a, a tremendous life. He was Polish, right? Yes, That's and right. he lived his last years in Australia, though. I want to ask you this. Do you think that, do, do you abide by the theory that if you're born in, in a country like Poland, you would automatically, through blood, be able to play mazurkas the way he and Rosenthal and maybe Arthur Rubinstein I, do? I think that although uh, there have been pianists that weren't Polish, say, that play Chopin well, just as there have been non-Hungarian pianists that play Hungarian music well, I think when you're from a country and have heard the culture, mm -hmm. uh, well, heard the music and felt the culture of the country, it can sort of give you a uh, an insider's view, sort of an insight into playing this music that an outsider may not be able to fully understand. On the other that? hand, I do feel that there's a certain something to be gained by speaking the language and understanding the rhythms that are going on around you. But I also feel that when you take two people who are Polish, such as Rosenthal and Friedman, and who play mazurka so totally differently with the same background, mm -hmm. that I think that that says to me that the background is not the most essential thing and that it's certainly possible to give it a totally convincing interpretation of mazurka without that. I agree, although I still think that Friedman would have a little more trouble than you would in producing the uh, Rhapsody in Blue, let's say, on the piano. <laughs> anyway, let's, uh, that's an argument which has taken place now for uh, five generations and will continue after us. Let's hear this supposedly most beautiful nocturne ever recorded. And of course, it was recorded on a 78. It's an E flat, not the famous Opus 9, number 2, but the later one, Opus 55, number 2, a labyrinth of beautiful texture. Here is Ignaz Friedman, who was born 1882, the same year as Percy Granger, by the way, and the who same was year born in Australia, and he died in, in Australia. 
and he died in 1948. Let's hear Ignaz Friedman. What a performance of the E-flat, Opus 55, number one nocturne of Chopin in the hands of Friedman. And after these messages, we'll be back when Bruce Posner and Joe Patrich give us our next selection, which will be in the hands of de Pachmann. 
This is David Dubal, and I am back with my guests, Bruce Posner and Joe Patrich, who host every week a program titled Concert Grand, where they introduce some of the most wonderful recordings, and they they interview everyone they can in the piano field, and they've had a fabulous life in the last five years doing this, and, and it's really a high adventure you've had, because you'll walk into a a home of an artist, and, and there, there's a whole atmosphere with each person. And you also find out many individual personal facts that there is otherwise no way to find out. Mm -hmm. You really get to see what the business is like today and what music really means to mm -hmm. these musicians. You know, the earliest in birth of the people that we'll be hearing today is Vladimir de Pachman, born in that fabled city of Odessa, I believe, and then he studied with Dach at the Vienna Conservatory. And he was really quite something, especially in the 1890s, and then he became more an object of, of clownery, right? Well, he has a bad reputation He does, today. and uh, well, I think people, some of the great pianists like Buzzoni, um, added to this by saying, you know, what is Buzzoni's famous statement, you know, if you cannot do all that the Pachman does and much more, you are not a pianist. Mm -hmm. and Buzzoni was not alone in this sort of derision. Um, but uh, I think Joe should speak about this particular recording because this actually is not one of my favorites. So, Joe, you're yeah, on. Uh, you're on. Well, it is one of my favorites because when I first heard it, it's what uh, caused me to love this piece, uh, which is the Mendelssohn E minor prelude. from To the, the fugue, right? Right, yeah. from the six preludes in Fugues, Opus 35, and uh, uh, Pachman did not record the uh, the fugue. But um, there's something about this recording. It's just the speed and the the committedness of his playing. You know, this is a, a piece in arpeggios with a melody in, in the Tal song, Bergia. basically. Yeah. That's right. And... Um, it's just the way the way he does it, the the committedness of the playing, the speed, and actually, uh, if if one wants to say that Pachman had no technique, that's a silly statement. Another anyway, silly, yes, because yes. Uh, even the way he played this, and this this was done very late, 1927, mm -hmm. so he was um, 77 years old. Tell us a story or two about him. Honecker uh, dubbed him the uh, Chopinzi of the piano because well, he, of course, was, played so many Chopin works. Well, that wasn't the only reason. I think he called him the Chopinzi because of the way he looked on stage. Uh -huh. His shoulders hunched over. He looked like a chimp. Yes. So apparently he called him that. And Pachman used to uh, talk to the audience. And um, there's one famous story of uh, Godovsky uh, playing and Pachman rushed up on stage and pushed him aside and showed the audience and explained to them how he thought... The, this particular mm -hmm. phrase should be played, and uh, much to Godovsky's chagrin, he, he was, was a he was a real character. He <laughs> was good press before the uh, press agents That's right. had arrived. Let's hear one of Joe Patrick's favorite recordings: Vladimir de Pachman in Mendelssohn's E Minor Prelude, Opus Thirty Five, Number One. <laughs> Thank you. 
think of it, that is a man born in 1848 and we are in 1982 listening to Vladimir de Pachman in Mendelssohn's E Minor Prelude and Mendelssohn died a year before de Pachman was born. After these messages, more piano music from the legendary pianists according to Joe Patrich and Bruce Posner, and I agree with them. This is David Dubal, and uh, Bruce and Joe and I are discussing old-time pianists who have done great work. Samarov, Olga, that's an interesting woman, born in uh, 82, the same year as uh, Friedman and Granger. She was some teacher, too. She was uh, a marvelous pianist. I'd never heard her until about two months ago, and a friend of mine played for me some of her 78s, and I was astounded. This woman was mm -hmm. absolutely right up there as far as being a great musician, a great technician. Absolutely. And, um, you know, she was married to Stokowski for a while, was mm -hmm. originally from Texas, and her real last name is Hickenlooper, but that's not a good concert pianist name, so she adopted she was, this Samarov. She was told to change it. You have to have a Slavic name and if you're going to make a career in 1910, more or less. That's right. Mm -hmm. So uh, this particular recording, which is her own transcription of the little organ fugue in G minor, is a very famous piece, which I'm sure you will all recognize, is just... Probably, her, I think, her best recording, although she did a marvelous La Campanella, too, mm -hmm. uh, it's um, the clarity that comes out in the piano recording and and everything, the intertwining of the voices. It's, it's just amazing. It's amazing musicianship, mm -hmm. amazing piano playing. Everyone that studied with her, uh, Raymond Lewenthal, Weisenberg, Rosalind Turek, who was here recently, they all, uh, William Capel, I didn't know him, all admired her, her teaching ability, too. She was a, a star of the Juilliard School. Let's mm. hear the uh, little organ prelude uh, in G minor. Samarov is the pianist, Bach, the composer. And the transcription is her own. That's right.
have just heard Olga Samaroff, nay Hicken Looper from Texas, who was one of the great pianists, and uh, it was the uh, her own transcription of the little uh, organ prelude in G minor. Now we're coming to um, one of Liszt's great students, born 1862. Who's that? This is Moritz Rosenthal, and uh, he's certainly one of the uh, most successful uh, of Liszt's students. Um, and we're going to see the miniaturist, the poetic side of him, because he was also a heaven stormer. He would play the biggest pieces, uh, the Schumann fantasy. Um, no records of those, none unfortunately. Of those, but I, I remember uh, we had interviewed William Harms once, who was a Hoffman pupil, and he remembers in Curtis uh, someone approaching Rosenthal after he'd just given a Carnegie Hall recital and asked him how it had gone, and Rosenthal said, colossal, just colossal. <laughs> and uh, it probably was. Uh -huh. And uh, But we're going to hear two of his most poetic performances, and we'll hear them back to back, I think. Good. Um, that's the Chopin Etude in A flat, the Opus Posthumus, um, but uh, the one in three against two. There's another Opus Posthumus, A flat Etude, as well. And... Um, then the Mazurka, Opus 63, Number 3, in C-sharp minor, uh, from 1931 performance. And both of these are really otherworldly uh, in the poetry uh, department. And, and you uh, agree, too, Joe. Yes. Well, my my particular pick was the Mazurka, and Bruce's was the A2, and I just think the Mazurka is just lovingly played. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, it's the type of performance you just love mm -hmm. because of the way he phrases and shapes things. It's... Let's hear then back to back the A flat etude opus posthumous, the, the uh, Nouvelle etudes, right? right? Yes. And the uh, C sharp minor opus 63 number three mazurka and the artist Moritz Rosenthal. <laughs>
the A flat etude and a mazurka in C sharp minor played by Moritz Rosenthal, Chopin, of course, the composer. We have enough time to have Paderewski on in one of his best recordings, but I can't resist asking you to, to give me one of those famous anecdotes, um, antidotes of uh, Rosenthal. Well, there was the one about um, that a number of pianists were signing uh, a little card or whatever it was, and it was a little space at the bottom, and some unnamed pianist said, what am I supposed to put in this little space? And Rosenthal turned to him and said, your repertoire. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so many of those little uh, sarcastic quips and a little a little pamphlet should should be compiled because they're all wonderful now we're coming to a man that if the word nobility is used at all it should be used in conjunction with that career that president of Poland that that wonderful um, person but more than anything I think Paderewski was a pianist and a personality yes the thing that comes through in this recording aside from the absolutely phenomenal pianism which uh, I think shows you how underrated Paderewski was as a pianist today. Um, this is a performance that you can identify immediately within the first few bars mm -hmm. as being Paderewski's. Mm -hmm. um, and I, this is a performance of Liz Salagereza. There are many great performances of these pieces, mostly by old pianists. Mm -hmm. um, but this one stands out in my mind, not perhaps not because it is you know, the way Liszt would have done it, whatever that means, but uh, because it is the way Paderewski would have done it, and it is eminently successful as that. And that finger work does not show a technical weakling, does That's it? That's right. He was he was considered by his peers to be virtually a non-pianist. Yes. So uh, that's called jealousy. You understand? Probably the envy syndrome. Well, uh, this is a recording that belies all that nonsense. This man's career was one of the most amazing in the history of anyone's in the in the word career. I mean, and he he played the piano wherever there could be a piano, from you know South Africa to Australia to to Minnesota and. Uh, I have talked to people, and I said, was he really that wonderful? Was he really that noble a spirit? And they said, well, it was like he turned on a button in the morning. He got up, and it was just pure nobility for the rest of the day. <laughs> so we'll hear the concert etude called La Leggerezza by Liszt in the hands of the 1860 to 1941 buried in Arlington National Cemetery on the order of Roosevelt as a war hero. Ignaz Jan Paderewski. Thank you. 
Paderewski himself playing the F minor leggerezza etude of Liszt. We have to go. We have heard nine fantastic ancient recordings by the legends of the piano playing world, and they were brought to us by Bruce Posner and Joe Patrich, who hosts that wonderful weekly program five years straight of the Concert Grand on WFUV. It has been wonderful having you both here. Thank you. Thank you very much. In the springtime, we'll have another selection from your great library. This is David Dubal. Thank you for listening. For the Love of Music, with today's host, David Dubal, WNCN Music Director. We hope you'll be with us when once again we meet to listen and exchange ideas, all for the love of music. For the Love of Music is produced by WNCN New York, GAF Broadcasting Company.